Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Nambi Kim, and I'm a 19-year-old student currently studying here in Nelson Mandela School in Berlin. And I'm completing the second year of the IB diploma, like Yulinka is in the IB too. Um, I would like, before I get into my talk, I would like to give out a very big shout out to Nelson Mandela School and all the <laughs> students sitting in the crowd here today. Okay, so to give you a very short introduction about myself, um, I was raised in Korea until the age of nine when my mom took the sudden bold decision to move to India. Don't ask me why. And I lived in India for another nine years before moving to Berlin a year and a half ago. So I'm here today to share with you my story following the theme of the spark. So oftentimes, when people think of this word, the spark, they associate it with the spark in my life, my spark experience, as one defined moment in time where either one was inspired, awakened, or perhaps went through a big epiphany. A moment where you started to see something new. However, for me, the spark has a rather different meaning. The spark for me isn't one specific moment, but rather a stretched out time period in which I went through a number of different experiences. Um, the specific time period which I'm referring to is the nine years I spent living in a UNESCO-supported community called Oroville in India. So you're most probably thinking, what in the world's name is Oroville? Um, I would like to see uh, hands up in the crowd to people who've ever been to or lived in Oroville. Or, or heard of Orville, sorry. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> it's nice to see a couple of hands up in the crowd. So to briefly summarize Orville, Orville is what we can call a universal city in the making. Orville is located in the southern part of India, and it consists of people from over 43 nationalities who all come together for the sole purpose of developing human unity. And what that means is, Oroville is a community where people from all over the world, they come together to share one dream. The dream of putting aside all social and cultural differences and prejudices, aside in the aspiration of creating an environment where people can live together in harmony. So here in this community with the current population of 2,200 people, my story begins. In Oroville, interestingly enough, I feel as though I was encouraged to raise myself for a good number of nine years. And of course, this goes against the common understanding with which people believe that child is raised or that children are taught by adults what is good or bad or what is wrong or right. But in Oroville, I was given the freedom to do what I wanted to do, but moreover, to, do, to not do what I simply didn't want to do. Because oftentimes, in modern society, the youth find themselves doing something or pursuing something which they simply don't want to do, but they're forced to in a way because they're expected to. In my opinion, there were no societal expectations which, one had, which the youth had to fulfill. So then, like, getting into Oroville a bit, like, people call each other by first names in Oroville, and interestingly enough, students call their teachers by first names. We don't have anything called Mr. and Mrs. It doesn't exist. And why we do this in Oroville is to avoid creating a hierarchic system or avoid creating any sense of authority between the citizens in the, in, in the community. And I realize that I'm describing a lot of things which may be a bit hard for you to, to relate with. So I'm going to um, share with you two of my personal experiences and maybe you can understand better what I'm trying to say. So the first one occurred when I was in the fifth grade in Oroville. It was a small incident with my math teacher. It was right after math class, and all my classmates and I were eager to rush out of the room. I mean, it was break time. Everybody wants to get out of class. But my math teacher was quick to call us back in, and she told us to sweep the room. Back then, frankly, we all didn't understand why we had to do so, because there's a cleaning staff. There was a cleaning staff whose job was to clean all the classrooms at the end of each day. Nevertheless, we listened to our teacher, and we started sweeping the room. But meanwhile, the teacher kept on commenting about how sloppily we're working. I mean, we're working fast because we wanted to save our holy break time. And at the end, she told us to sweep the room once more. 
Before I could even control the words which were shooting out of my mouth, I can't believe I said this. I have to admit, I'm a, I was a pretty cheeky child growing up. What I said was, if you can do so much better than us, why won't you do it instead of bossing us around? I was 12 years old, and I actually shouted at the teacher with that exact tone. As a result, I was given a 500 words essay to answer the question, what would the world be without cleaning ladies? So, <laughs> So you have to keep in mind, in a country like India, the service sector plays a huge role because many households have cleaning staff or a cleaning lady. So then, in a country like India, to answer a question like that for a child of 12 years old of age, it requires a lot of thinking and reflection. And what I'm trying to convey to you by telling this story is that I was never blamed, punished, or scolded for what would be considered a figure of authority, my teacher. Instead, I was given this time and space to reflect myself and my actions. As you can imagine, my mother, on the other hand, she's sitting right there in the crowd, she wasn't very happy. <laughs> she told me, you're lucky you're not in Korea, because if you were in Korea, first of all, this teacher would have been furious, and secondly, you would have got a nice beating. Thank the Lord I was in India. So moving on to the second incident, it happened when my mother was sitting in the community cafeteria when she ran into my brother's art teacher. So they sat down and they started drinking a cup of coffee together. That's when the art teacher told my mom, your son produced an interesting piece of artwork today. The other teachers, they didn't like it too much. Um, so before I get into further details, my brother was 13 years old, and he was hitting puberty. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, so then um, the teacher continued by saying, um, I gave all my students today a free assignment to do a collage on a topic of their choice. And what my brother came up with is a big collage, imagine a big poster, with a big, big title in capital bold letters, Honey, More Sex, Please. <laughs> and... <laughs> It doesn't end there. Um, this <laughs> shocking title was also surrounded by naked, images of naked women, and there were fancy cars involved too. <laughs> my mother was a bit shocked at first, but she was quick to explain my brother's intentions by saying, you see, a boy of three, 13 years old of age, you can imagine that those are the things which are circling his mind. Sorry, boys. And... <laughs> All he really wanted to do by doing something like that is to express himself. And here again, what I'm trying to say with this story is that in Oroville, we were given the freedom to, to express ourselves and without the fear of being judged or told that it is wrong to do so. So with a situation like this, most teachers would, okay, most we can't generalize, but many teachers would contact the parent out of concern um, your 13 years old boy is already talking about sex. What is he being exposed to at home? This is not normal behavior. But instead of a situation like that, my mother and the teacher were able to sit down and have a very casual, relaxed, and chilled conversation over the matter. And frankly, they had a very good laugh. So coming back to me, I grew up with this enormous amount of freedom. But as time passed by, what I realized was that having freedom also meant taking responsibility for your actions. The more you enjoy your freedom, the more responsibility you must take for your actions. Going back to the personal incident I had with my math teacher, like I said, I was not blamed nor scolded. But instead, I was given this time and space to, to think and realize that there was no way to talk to anybody, whether it was your teacher, your mother, or some random person you met on the street. So you see, pe without people dictating to me what is wrong or right, or dictating me with strong guidelines, I managed to find that right balance and increase that self-awareness in me, and in a way, self-discipline myself. So this process of me finding the right balance between freedom and responsibility, at the end, taught me independence. It taught me to think independently. It helped me to work independently at my own speed. And moreover, it just it helped me to grow into an independent person. 
So most of you at this point are probably thinking, what is she doing in Berlin? Why did she leave paradise? Because Orville sounds pretty cool. If I were you, I'd probably be thinking the same thing and asking the same questions. It was never my choice to go to Orville. Like I mentioned before, it was my mother's bold decision to move to India. And as a child, all I did was follow my mother. Uh, what is very ironic is that it was never my decision to leave Oroville either. On the 30th of December 2011, we, um, Oroville was struck by a cyclone and Oroville was left ravaged and completely destroyed. We didn't have electricity uh, for nearly a month and that, nearly, that also meant that we didn't have access to water from taps. So can you imagine without living without electricity nor water for a whole month? So amidst this natural disaster, four days after the cyclone, I was struck with dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is a tropical disease causing internal bleeding and through which people can die within a week's time. So the dengue virus is a virus which is transmitted through mosquitoes. And um, at the time, I was transferred to a big hospital where there was a blood specialist specializing in the treatment of internal bleeding. And after I had received four units of blood transfusion in the emergency room, I was moved to the intensive care unit. And in the ICU, I was wrapped by all sorts of medical cords and, and cables, and my bed was put perpendicularly in 90 degrees so as to avoid me falling asleep because the doctors were in fear that I would never wake up again. My body was at its weakest. I remember not even being able to move a finger. But what's strange is that in that room, my mind was at its clearest and it was so sober, sober enough to be able to feel the death surrounding me in that room. The sound of medical equipment beeping like crazy, the sound of rushing doctors and nurses, the sound of the dying patients around me were all I could hear. And sitting on that vertical bed, I could also see the lifeless bodies with a cloth covering the bodies being carried out of the room. And this I did not only see once, but several times. And I remember at one point thinking to myself, Am I going to be the next one, like one of the next ones to go and have that white cloth over my, over my body? And on top of all this, my mother was only allowed in the intensive care unit into the room for five minutes a day. And I never felt in so much isolation. I never craved company as much as I did during those days in the ICU. And there, I experienced death and life both at its closest. And I could see the fine line separating life and death. I really don't know how to put all this into words because it really is an indescribable feeling being in a situation like that. But I realized, I realized how precious life is. Thinking that I may not live to see another day, and I thought about all those ordinary days all those ordinary days which you would never think about in any other situation, those normal days, you carrying out your normal routine, daily routine, I thought about those days and I thought about how those days were the biggest gift which I could have ever received in my life. After I was stabilized, I was released to a normal ward. And just as I had thought, okay, everything is over, I'm here, I can go back to my normal life in Oroville. The doctor informed my mother and I that I was to leave India immediately. He informed us that India was no longer a safe environment for me as another bite from a dengue mosquito would have life-threatening life risks. And if I would be bitten again, there may be very little the doctors or anybody else for that matter could do for me. And he advised me as a doctor, as my doctor, to leave the country and to move to a non-tropical country where there are no presence of dengue mosquitoes and I would not be um, threatened. 
this came as a massive shock to me. If, if you were to leave a country, your home, a place where you spent nine years of your life, it's nice to get a small notice beforehand. But this was not the case for me. It was exactly like Cyclone Thane, which had struck Oroville. Nobody had ever expected that to happen to Oroville or to me. I had it all planned out. I, my friends all know that I like my plans and I like it when things go my way. And I was planning to graduate from high school in Oroville with my A-levels and um, apply to universities abroad. But when this happened, everything crumbled in front of my eyes. Everything f shattered into pieces. And what was the most difficult was that I did not know how to put myself together or put all those pieces back together to take that next step forward. And at one point, I remember, I remember I was so angry. I remember shouting to myself, not to anyone else, but to myself, why did this happen to me? Why, do I, why did I deserve this type of achievement from life? And what did I ever do wrong to deserve this? Yes, it is pretty scary to face the unknown. However, I learned through overcoming that period in my life that sometimes we're all bound to face unpredictable or unexpected events in our lives which will, which will change our lives dra dramatically. Sometimes you're taken by a storm and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. But during the storm, you need to stay calm and accept everything that's happening. Then must you gather all your strength and courage to make the necessary steps. And during that process, my perspectives and views change drastically. I, I learn to see what is important and what is not. And of course, the importance of family. Overall, I became a much more humble person, so to speak. And I don't think there will ever be another place in the whole wide world where, where um, a place which could have given me as much as Orville did during those nine years I spent there. And everything which happened to me in, in Orville, including dengue hemorrhagic fever, I would never take it back. Because I have learned to cherish those moments as it has turned me or helped me transform myself into the person I am today and put me in the fortunate position I am in today. After some time has passed, I realized that I am in a good place, in a great city, in Berlin, in a great school, with amazing people around me. And just before I come to my closing remarks, I would like to take this time to thank my parents, my mother, my father, my stepfather, and all my, other family, um, all my other family members and friends also who were supportive, through, uh, supportive throughout the whole process. I really couldn't have done it without them. And I would really especially like to thank my mother and my stepfather who, s who left India, who left their, in t their, both their lives in India just to be with me in Berlin, just to come move to Berlin with me and support me and help me build this new life in Berlin. I, I don't think I can ever thank them enough for doing what they did. Later in life, when I'll be faced with new challenges, I'll know exactly what I have to do. I'll have to take a deep breath, and I'll tell myself, yes, it is difficult, but through this, something new will come. And through this, I will become stronger. And through this, I will grow. So I would like to end this talk by saying this to all of you. Stay in the flow of life. Sometimes sunny days, sometimes stormy days. But anyways, life will carry us where we need to be. Have faith, believe in yourself, and take the challenge. Thank you.